in those days that paparazzi was something else. I mean, something extraordinary. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen still to today, to me, to other people, but, um, you know, I remember, I remember that night out. <laughs> I remember the paparazzi trying to get in the door, uh, to get in the car. I remember being hit over the head by cameras. I remember my security doing everything they could to try to keep them away. It felt like harassment. It felt horrible then, it feels horrible now. How do you feel today here? I seem to have no privacy at all. Please look towards, towards me, and then we'll go off. Come on, that. All right, guys, that's it. You know, wherever I went, whatever I did, there could well be uh, a photographer or a journalist waiting, watching. Some say the loss of privacy is simply the price you pay for fame and fortune. But Hugh Grant believes that as his profile grew, so too did the illegal acts used against him. This isn't something that's only about phone hacking. There was microphones in window boxes outside the house. There were trackers, microphones dropped into my car. Uh, there were medical records of me and, and uh, mothers of my children, for instance. All blagged and stolen out of the NHS. And uh, perhaps most spectacularly, the burglary of both my flat and my office. The actor recently made these claims in legal action against The Sun, allegations the newspaper has always denied. Can you take me back to that moment when you discovered you'd been burgled? Uh, so, in the case of my flat burglary, yeah, it was quite spectacular in that the, 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 the whole door had been taken off its hinges. Uh, uh, up, up, up it's, it's a big walk up, like four floors up, and yes, they, they'd been through the flat and nothing was stolen. They'd been there to get uh, information. And a lot of information about the interior and the contents of my flat appeared in newspapers a couple of days later. And uh, there's never been a burglary before or since. But back then, Hugh says even contacting the police brought its own risks. These people live above the law. And the police, I'm afraid, at that least at that stage, were as dangerous as the reporters. If you called the police about anything, I remember my girlfriend getting mugged just around here. Uh, if you called them, you were absolutely sure that the first person who would turn up would not be a policeman, it would be a reporter. Because the Met just got straight on the phone to the, the tabloids, took them off. Most of the more difficult or illegal acts were farmed out to private investigators, PIs, specialising in what was known as the dark arts. And sometimes they had links to the police. Peter, which isn't his real name, was a serving officer, whilst moonlighting as a PI. He says he worked for Mirror Group and News Group newspapers. We mainly specialised in the surveillance side of things. Anything from accessing voicemails, getting into people's emails, phone tapping. If you personally couldn't get hold of information, how did you go about finding it? What did you do? We had um, a network of subcontractors who could help us with getting any information that, that we wanted. Some of them were more prevalent in blagging, some were good at IT stuff, and some were good at phone tapping. Do you think that the people who commissioned your work knew that the information could only have come from unlawful methods? It was a bit like the Wild West, really. It was very open, everything was talked about. I don't think that there were ever a time where anyone would say you need to be careful about this. But away from Fleet Street their victims and the public had no idea. Until in 2005 a chain of events at the News of the World exposed their unlawful tactics. The Royal Correspondent of the News of the World, Clive Goodman, is plodding away in the News of the World office, not doing terribly well. There's this private investigator in the, in the background, Glenn Malcare, who's helping other people to hack voicemail. Goodman hooks up with him and says, come on, help me out here, mate. The mistake that Goodman and Malcare made was to target the one group of people in this country who have more prestige and more power 
than Rupert Murdoch and his company, the royal family. They systematically targeted phone numbers from the royal household and to some extent they were successful. Their hacking did bring in exclusives about Prince Harry and William, but the details were so specific they could only have come from one place, voicemails. Buckingham Palace grew suspicious and contacted the police. In August 2006, Clive Goodman and Glenn Mulcair are arrested. The police seize the private investigators' notebooks containing thousands of names and mobile numbers, but no one else at the News of the World is charged. Within months, Scotland Yard closes the police investigation, only giving their reasons years later. Our inquiries show that in the vast majority of cases, there was insufficient evidence to show that tapping had actually been achieved. The pair are convicted in January 2007. Though the paper's editor, Andy Coulson, says he had no idea it had been going on, he resigns and moves on to a new job as director of communications for the then opposition leader, David Cameron. I believe in giving people a second chance. In February, the paper's new editor says an internal investigation found it had been a rogue exception carried out by a single reporter in their newsroom. And the news of the world succeeded at that time at strapping down a cover-up. They were allowed to get away with claiming nothing to see here, one dodgy reporter, that's it. And they very, very nearly got away with that. The, the police didn't act quickly enough. I, I was deputy editor of the News of the World before the hacking era. Later on, I, I, again, before the... And this sort of stuff just didn't happen to people like us, you know? It was proper fairy tale stuff. <laughs> I was aware of the press coverage that I was getting, but I had absolutely no context for it. I'd never read anything, any sort of newspaper, or I was reading things like smash hits. Um, <laughs> but that was about it. This new global superstar was in demand, but once the angelic child became a teenager, yeah, now it's an amazing. The tabloid tone shifted. I'm going to know exactly where I'm going, little fuckheads. They're going to follow us. They cannot follow us. We're going to have to lose them, Mac. Well, I'm trying. From the ages of like, you know, 15 to 21, essentially, I had an inescapable abuser. The press. They used to cut holes in hedges and stuff where, where we lived and where, where, where my friends lived so they could use long lenses and we wouldn't necessarily know that they were there. And then, of course, when I was acting like a normal teenager, they sensationalised that to such a point where you would have thought that I was like, I, I completely out of control. <laughs> person on hard drugs and, th and, and then you know have everybody believe that it's so dehumanizing many of the stories went beyond press intrusion from the age of 16 onwards she was being hacked by the news of the world there were so many articles that stood out to me as being like, there is no way, like, like where are they listening? It, there's just a level of paranoia and anxiety. We used to say, God, have they tapped, have they tapped our phones? Are they, have they got microphones in our house? Charlotte believes an article in the Daily Mail was the result of phone tapping. There was one story I remember where I was having an argument with my mum and dad on the phone. I was literally by myself. Nobody could have overheard us. And it was a live conversation. It was a live conversation which ended up in the Daily Mail. It's just such a violation. And there was just, there were so many stories like that. The Daily Mail say that Charlotte has never complained about this article and it was based on an overheard conversation in a public place. They categorically deny unlawful information gathering, as does the journalist who wrote the story. But for the papers looking for a scoop, anyone connected to Charlotte became collateral damage. My mother was already an incredibly vulnerable woman. Her mental health was really bad. 
I'd found her after taking an overdose. She was in a really bad way and that was straight in the press. Straight in the press, no idea again where it came from. I mean, it was horrific. And she's never been able to, to fully come back from the abuse that she suffered. My parents, they weren't public people. Um, they had never courted it and they just got absolutely mullered, completely mullered by the tabloid press. Um, like they were fair game, like I was fair game. Why was I fair game? Their motivation could be put down to one factor, money. There was this ruthless determination to beat the opposition. You have these big profit-seeking corporations and they pass down the need to make profit, which gets translated into a need to find stories in order to sell more copies, in order to have more readers. And the criminality in these newspapers is the logical outcome of the constant drive for more and more profit from their bosses. If you wanted a career in newspapers and you wanted a career in the tabloid, you had to put your head down and do what you were told. And so you saw this kind of escalating screw of anxiety going on with people trying to find out, well, how do you get the scoops? Where are these stories coming from? And I think that pushed people into using shortcuts. Even now, few from inside the tabloid world admit to being part of any illegality. Paul McMullen spent seven years at the News of the World, one of Britain's most popular papers. These days, he runs a pub on the south coast. What sort of pressure was there to deliver exclusives and stories? Uh, at the News of the World, if you did less than 12 exclusives a year, you got fired. But sometimes the methods to get those stories were unlawful. Was that justified? Uh, perfectly, yeah, because what is in the public interest, and I think the public is capable of saying what it's interested in, and the very fact that five million people put their hand in their pocket and paid a pound to read it, surely that is public interest enough. Isn't there a difference between public interest and what interests the public? No, it's exactly the same. It has to be. Can you list for me the kinds of um, unlawful tactics that you took part in? Yeah, I did loads of illegal things. Stole things. Uh, I mean, blagged things. I did blagging. Even that now is illegal. I mean, I'll tell you a great blag uh, on Bob Geldof, if you like, to give you an idea. So Bob, he got off with this girl in France. So we rang up the hotel and said, so, because I speak French, I said, uh, we are Monsieur Geldof's accountants. Can you send us his bill? So they faxed us over the bill. Everything he'd had on room service, all the numbers he'd called. So we just called through all the numbers and worked out who his new girlfriend was which I think is a brilliant piece of investigative journalist reason. But is that illegal? Yes. Oh, well, anyway, it probably wasn't in the 90s. Then there's the act of voicemail interception or phone hacking, a legally grey area until it was made a crime in the year 2000. But Paul tells me it didn't stop the news of the world from doing it on an industrial scale. Did you hack anyone? Uh, I didn't really have to because, um, well, I was senior enough not to have to do it. The people who did it were the reporters who were trying to get on and they were bullied by the bosses. But you know, they hacked everyone's phone. I mean, literally everyone's phone. We had a number. We were going to listen to it. It was almost an industry standard technique. Uh, everybody did it all the time. We didn't see it as bad. We didn't see it as illegal. So you could say it's pretty victimless crime. You didn't even know. But don't people have a right to privacy? You might want privacy, but you don't need it. The only people who actually need it are people who are doing something fundamentally wrong or bad. And that's why we had all the, our surveillance techniques to catch them out. Now it's alleged the tricks of some of the tabloids went far beyond just phone hacking. There was microphones in window boxes and medical records, all blagged and stolen.
Five years had passed since the arrests at the News of the World. Britain had moved on, and at the tabloid papers, it was business as usual. But then the story took on a new dimension, centered on Millie Dowler, a teenager who'd been murdered seven years earlier. Tonight, it's alleged a private detective working for the News of the World hacked into the missing girl's mobile phone and listened to her messages. I understood that the targeting of Millie Dowler was the most powerful story we had done so far and said so to the editor when I filed it. I didn't foresee the extent to which it would make the whole House of Cards collapse. And people felt completely outraged that a couple of journalists were tampering with a, a live police inquiry into the murder of a schoolgirl. And this went beyond anything to do with hacking into the phone of a celebrity. This was on another scale. Something had to be done. Politicians don't want to alienate the press. They never have. But if the public feel that way, then the politicians can't ignore it. And the politicians didn't. Just days after the story broke, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, announced a two-part public inquiry into the scandal. These are the questions that need answering. Why did the first police investigation fail so abysmally? What exactly was going on at the News of the World? And what was going on at other newspapers? That weekend, after 168 years, the News of the World closed for good with this sentimental final front page. But shocking though it was, the hacking of Millie Dowler wasn't a lone example. It's now thought thousands of people who weren't famous were potentially targeted in the same way. At least four explosions have rocked central London in a major coordinated terrorist attack. Paul Dadge was propelled onto the front pages when he was photographed helping the wounded in the aftermath of the 7-7 London bombings. It's obviously a memory that's deeply ingrained upon me, um, more so mentally. Um, but yeah, it's it, it, that, that picture changed my life. I just wanted to help people on that day. I can just remember hearing the shutters of the cameras growing and click, 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 click. I was now being held up as this heroic poster boy when, in effect, for me, people had died underground and I found that very difficult to deal with. For the media, that photo teased a mystery they couldn't wait to reveal. Do you know if she had been in the blaster train or the one ahead of you? I don't know that now. I didn't ask for that. Do you know which hospital she's in? Don't know that now. Hungry for the next scoop, every journalist wanted to know the identity of the woman behind the mask. By the time I'd left that concourse, the story had been told to pretty much everybody who was there and everybody importantly had my mobile number because I just said there's my mobile you know if you need anything else let me know and I'll help you out as much as I can. Days after the hacking of Millie Dowler's phone came to light police contacted Paul to let him know he too had been hacked by the news of the world. I wasn't surprised because there was such an enormous pressure on journalists to deliver the story of myself and the person I was pictured with. And I remember at some point, I got told by one journalist that she was gonna lose her job if she didn't get this story. He since received compensation and newsgroup newspapers expressed regret for the distress caused. We weren't celebrities. This wasn't salacious gossip. We were just normal people who got involved in a horrific incident. When something like that happens, it makes you feel very vulnerable because you've lost control of the story of what you want to tell and what you don't want to tell. And that's very, very hard. It does take its toll on you. The 
Oliver Leveson inquiry began on the 14th of November 2011. 57 celebrities, politicians and members of the public who were victims of press intrusion gave evidence across its 97 days. One of them, Christopher Jeffries, a retired school teacher who found himself in the centre of a media storm during a murder investigation. I uh, could barely go out. Uh, in effect, I'd become a prisoner in my own house. Christopher had been the landlord of Joanna Yates, a young woman whose body was found in Bristol on Christmas Day in 2010. I opened the door, at which point I was told I was being arrested on suspicion of the murder of Joe Yates. That is the psychological equivalent, I think, of being given a, a knockout blow. He spent three days in police custody. By the time he was released without charge, headlines had untruthfully painted him as a snooping, over-sexualized predator linking him to a convicted paedophile and even a previously unsolved murder. The picture that was being painted in the tabloids, it was a sensational story, uh, was something they wanted to exploit. It was perfectly clear that in reporting the case as they had, uh, one of the motives of the newspapers was to whip up as much public anger against me as they could. He was awarded substantial damages and a public apology from eight newspapers for more than 40 libelous articles. But recently he learned some papers may have been using unlawful tactics against him and is now bringing a claim against newsgroup newspapers, owners of The Sun and The News of the World. The allegation is that um, I was subjected to all sorts of illegality, but it's further confirmation that there are almost no depths to which certain um, elements of the media will not stoop. Whilst the Leveson inquiry gave victims of press intrusion the chance to share their experience, most of the 300 people giving evidence were insiders from the worlds of press, politics and the police. There is a great deal of official secrecy around what actually goes on in the power elite. And suddenly, there they were, being forced to talk in public. Four prime ministers, senior civil servants, senior police officers, and the most secretive beasts in the jungle, newspaper editors, hauled out, on oath, in public. Now tell us what's been going on. Those at the helm of the news of the world were quick to make denials. Witnesses, Mr. Coulson, please. No, they didn't wield too much power over politicians. I'm not sure I necessarily buy the theory that uh, a newspaper's endorsement will influence its readers directly in that way. No, they didn't influence the police. Um, I felt that the contact I had with police officers, uh, particularly commissioners and senior police officers, was always appropriate. And above all, no, they didn't know about the industrial scale hacking that went on inside the paper. I think the senior executives uh, were all uh, misinformed and uh, shielded from anything that was going on there. Uh, someone took charge of a, of a cover-up, uh, which we were victim to, and I regret. This inquiry wasn't just about the news of the world. Good morning, Mr. Good morning, sir. Our first witness is Mr. Hipwell. Thank you. I, James Hipwell, do solemnly, sincerely, and truly... The entire tabloid industry was under scrutiny, but just one journalist was willing to blow the whistle on unlawful behaviour at another paper. James Hipwell was a columnist at the Daily Mirror. I was sitting next to the showbiz journalists, and I saw phone hacking going on. From the middle of 1999, I would say that I saw it happen every day. There were eight or ten journalists on the show business desk, and most of them were engaged in phone hacking. Can you tell me who was your editor at the time, and did he know about what was happening? 
My editor was Piers Morgan. He was ob somewhat obsessive about celebrity news. There was no question that he knew what was going on because he would ask them, you know, where did this story come from? And did you get the impression that this was just a technique used by Mirror Group newspapers? No. I mean, on one uh, occasion, I remember great laughter in the newsroom. And so I asked what was going on. And this journalist had, he'd hacked into the voicemail of one of the, one of the Spice Girls. Um, and um, he knew that his, uh, one of his opposite numbers on the sun was going to be hacking the same phone and would have picked up the same message message and he didn't want um, that journalist to hear the message so he just deleted it the sun deny this james lost his job on the city column after he was caught insider trading lawyers for the mirror papers at the leveson inquiry tried unsuccessfully to discredit him suggesting these claims were his revenge some might accuse you of having an axe to grind because you lost your job at the daily mirror that didn't really come into it. I mean, um, I see the mirror now as a criminal enterprise. My column was part of that criminal enterprise. I accept that. Uh, I know that, um, you know, we needed to be um, reined in. And it's not often in your life that you, you get a, an opportunity um, to look back at what's just happened and reflect on it um, and try to, try to put things right. But James was a lone voice amidst a clamour of denials from Mirror Group bosses. Well, by Almighty God, that the evidence I shall give. Should give the truth, the whole truth. Is the truth. Denials that two High Court judges presiding over civil cases against the papers have since found to be untrue. Is it true uh, that there was uh, phone hacking going on amongst the show business team? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. The inaccuracy of this statement has been established. I have seen no evidence to show me that phone hacking has ever taken place at Trinity Math. Ms Bailey knew, or turned a blind eye to it, from about the end of 2006. Are you able to help us again as to whether or not it's true? I'm afraid I'm not. I have already found that she was involved in it, and she clearly had knowledge of it. I have no reason or knowledge to believe it was going on. But did you see this sort of thing going on, Mr. Morgan? No. You sure about that? 100%. There is compelling evidence that the editors of each newspaper knew very well that voicemail interception was being used extensively and habitually, and that they were happy to take the benefits of it. I think the police need to investigate this because we could have a situation where a number of important witnesses to a government-backed British taxpayer-funded inquiry um, have lied. And um, that's just simply unacceptable. Perhaps the most shocking revelation to come out of Prince Harry's court action is that these unlawful tactics continued during the Leveson inquiry. What is so strange about the fact that they continued committing the crime is that it looks as though they think that they are beyond the law, impunity. But by then they know they're not beyond the law. The risk level is astonishing. When the 16-month inquiry came to an end in 2012, its key recommendation for a new, tougher industry watchdog was effectively ignored by the papers, with concerns over press freedom. We do have an independent regulator, but most of the press are not in any way attached to it. And the regulator cannot function if none of the organisations that it is intended to regulate actually join it. Many say the tabloids under the spotlight had got off lightly, but then a new case brought fresh scrutiny. And I went paranoid. You know, you wanted to speak to nobody. 